particular. So what's happening is that I'm sending these ASCII key characters in the master window. It's going out the master RN42, being received by the slave device, and populating inside this window. And if I highlight the slave, and I type in here, you can see now that information appears in the master window. That was one other thing. Oops, oops uh, crap. That was one other thing that I want to cover, which is, uh, Let's say you want on power up for the devices to connect to each other automatically. What you need to do is you don't want this to be master anymore. If you look at the help for FM, you have these various options. What you want is the auto option, which is the auto master. So on power up, what you want your module to do is to automatically reconnect to your slave device. So I'm going to use FM3. No, let's try again. FM3. So now I'm in auto mode. Now if I reboot my master, so it becomes disconnected for a little bit, but now we'll reconnect again. In the last lesson, I covered the concept of FPGAs. We learned about the concept of HDLs, and then actually installed all the software that we need. Using that software, we were able to create an application that was able to blink the LEDs on and off for one second. Now in this lesson, what we're going to do is I'm going to go over a top-level design that consists of several VHDL components, and how to interconnect those. We're going to use the inputs and the outputs on the Mercury board. I'm also going to go over how to handle button inputs, finite state machines and registers. And I'm going to go over all these concepts by going over a simple example. In this example, what we will be doing is taking a button input and counting the amount of times that the button is pressed. And that count is going to be displayed in binary on the external LEDs. Now I just described kind of what the goal of the project is going to be. And the goal is to take an, an external button input and process it in such a way that we're going to develop a sort of counting device that's going to interface to external LEDs to count how many times the button was pressed in binary. So right now I'm just going to add the external peripherals for that. So here are the peripherals. We have the button input and you can see that there's a pull-up resistor that takes this node high. And then whenever the button is pressed, it will bring this node low because it's connected to the ground. And then over here is an array of four LEDs that's going to be connected externally from the Mercury board. Now, whenever I want to develop a VHDL application, no matter how big or small, it's always a good idea to draw out a sort of map of how this is going to look like beforehand. You don't really need to know exactly how the components that you define here are going to work exactly. You just kind of want like an idea of what you're going to do, like how your machine is going to work. So this is kind of a bit of a top-down approach where I'm going to define several modules. I'm not really too sure how they're going to work yet, but I'm just going to kind of declare what they're going to do and what I'm going to expect them to do. So I'm just going to get started. We first know that we want some sort of module that's going to take in this button input, and then every time it sees a rising edge, it's going to increment its counter and display that count on the LEDs in a binary count system. So I'm going to add that module now. So this is the module I'm proposing to do that. What I want this module to do is it's going to take in this button input. And then this counter out, you can see that's a thicker arrow because it's an array of signals. This array of signals consists of four lines that's going to connect to each one of these four LEDs. And then this button gets inputted here. I have a clock input and a reset input as well, which I'm going to use this onboard button to act as a reset. And then the onboard clock I'm going to use to drive the clock input on this module. But right now I'm already seeing a problem with this design because this would work really well with the button if this button was an ideal button where the signal looks something like this where well, we know it by default it's circle high, and then once the button is pressed, it goes immediately low and stays that way. But we know that that's not going to happen, because since this is a mechanical switch, what's really going to happen is that there's going to just be a ton of noise where you just get a bunch of jittery uh, spike in the switch before it finally drops down low. And you don't want it, your module here to inaccurately count each one of the spikes that occur. So it's pretty obvious that we need to proceed this button input with another module. This module is going to clean up the signal here, and it's going to take something like this, and turn it into a clean input. So now I added that to a module, and I called it the debounce hardware. I made this input called raw in, which is going to take in the raw button input, and then it has this clean out output that's going to connect to the clean button. And just as the button is connected to reset on board, and the clock is driving the clock input of that FSM counter, the same thing is going to happen for this module. The button's going to connect to reset, and the clock's going to drive the clock input. But things aren't exactly the way I want them yet. I could hypothetically connect this output straight to these LEDs, but one thing that I like to do is whenever I have no way of output like this. What I like to do is I like to proceed that with a register. And what the register is going to do is it's going to take values from the counter and then drive those outputs for me. It's going to be kind of the driver for these LEDs. So I'm going to eliminate this connection here and add the register here. So here's my register that I added. Now hopefully you know how a register works, but I'm going to try to do my best to explain it. What I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to have a 4-bit register that connects directly to these LEDs and have the counting output connect to the count of this register. A good way to look at a register is kind of a device to save information. So say for instance, we have a current count of three, and then we go to four. And you want to display four on the LED, so that's going to look like. So this signal was previously equal to three, and then we adjusted it to four. But four doesn't automatically get passed to the output here.
here to display on the LEDs until you set this load signal high. And once you set high, then forward gets passed through to the output. But after you have forward passed through to the output, you don't have to worry about keeping low high anymore. You could change this, you could have this be equal to four, change this input as much as you want, but until you load the register with the signal, then none of the input none of the inputs here are going to get passed through to the output and four is going to remain there. And as you can see the register also has clock and reset input. So this is kind of what I mean by a map. A map of how our system is going to work. It makes developing the VHDL for your application way easier because now you can kind of see what it is that you're developing. Uh, also I added this load register signal to connect to the register. So this is kind of how everything's going to look and now we just have to implement this in VHDL. But before we get into the VHDL, I kinda of want to think about how we're going to do this debout hardware. So let's consider how we're going to do this debout hardware. For the input of the debug hardware, we have a button that goes to the raw in, which is our input. And when the button is pressed, it's going to go from high to low. So for every single clock cycle, since this is my ideal button, it's first going to just kind of start off high, and then for the rest of the clock cycles, when the button is pressed, it's going to just kind of jitter a little bit until it finally settles and, and just stays low. So what we want to do is, for this debug hardware, is we're going to use the debug hardware to detect a time when we have a consecutive period of ones and zeros to kind of test for the stability of the button. So if we have a signal, for instance, which is 8 bits long, we'll call the signal S speed bounce. So if S speed bounce is 8 bits long, then it would look something like this. So kind of my plan for the debounce hardware is that on every clock cycle, on every rising edge of the clock, basically what we're going to do is we're going to take the signal S speed bounce and assign it 6 down to 0 and concatenate that with our raw in up here. So how is this going to work? Well, let's say, for instance, that button is currently high, which means S D bounce would be equal to all ones. But if the button becomes pressed, and then we start getting this sort of jittery feed that goes in, then on the next clock cycle, S D bounce is going to equal one one. Something like this. And then on the next clock cycle after that, it might look like this. And why does it look like that? Well, on every rising edge of the clock, we are taking the bit six down to zero, because remember this is an eight bit long signal, and so we're going to take the least significant seven bits of SD bounce, shifting them down to the, to the left over here, so that's where these ones went to, they just shifted in here, and then we concatenate at the end of SD bounce with whatever our raw input is. And for us it was zero, so then zero got shifted in. And then on the next clock cycle, these seven bits shifted over to here, and then the one got shifted in to SD bounce. So this is kind of a way to detect whether or not the button is stable or not, because 